continue today with our muscle discussion. Now let's first talk about some general principles and some terminology you see used with muscles in the body. First up here at the top, you see origin, insertion, and belly. Now origin is also sometimes called the head. Origin is probably the better word to use, but sometimes you'll hear the head used in its place. Now this is the more stationary end of attachment of a muscle. <clears throat> Look at something like your biceps brachii. You use that muscle along with some others to flex or bend at your elbow. So when you want to lift your hand up, maybe you got a weight in your right hand or left hand and you want to bend at that elbow, that biceps brachii muscle is a good one to use. Well, think about when that muscle gets shorter. If you look at one end of the muscle way up here close to your scapula, that end of the muscle does not move when you tell that muscle to contract. But if you look down here at your elbow, where that muscle attaches to these bones down here in your forearm, that end does move. So always think of origin as the stationary end of the muscle. Look at the end that doesn't move. The insertion is just the opposite. That's the end of the muscle that does move. And then the belly is just all the muscle in between those two points right there. Tendons and ligaments have been mentioned before as far, far back as, say, the section that dealt with different types of tissues. Don't confuse tendons with ligaments. They're made of the same thing. They're a dense, regular collagen arrangement of fibers. But remember, tendons are attaching muscles to bones where ligaments are bones to bones. So don't confuse those. And most of the time, tendons are round, sort of like a cable. But sometimes <clears throat> they are broad and flat. And that's what an aponeurosis is right there. We can also look at these words agonist and antagonist. Now, to use these two words, you would have to first specify an action. And let's say we went back to that biceps brachii muscle in the upper part of your limb and that brachial region on the anterior front part. If you said you wanted to flex at your elbow, again, like when you're bending at the elbow when you pick up something with your hand or whatever, you specify the action. The muscle that causes that particular action is the agonist. So you got to go with the action first, the muscle that causes that action is the agonist. And the muscle that works opposite <coughs> of the agonist is the antagonist. And again, if you look up here in the brachial region of your upper limb, look on the front anterior surface, you got that biceps brachii, and then posterior to the back, you got that triceps brachii. Well, notice anytime your biceps brachii muscles flexing, contracting, I should say, and getting shorter, the triceps getting longer, and just the opposite applies too. Those two muscles work opposite of each other. So again, the one that works opposite of the agonist will be the antagonist. Synergists are muscles working together, and we got a lot of that in the body. <clears throat> There's hundreds of skeletal muscles in the body. A lot of them work together. So anytime you talk about a group of muscles working together to cause a particular action, call them synergists. Now, if one of the muscles is bigger and stronger and does more of the work than the other ones do, call that one the prime mover. And down here, lastly, where we see fixators, some muscles <clears throat> aren't so much about moving bones, which again is what skeletal muscles are really for in most cases. Some of them fix joints. They hold bones together tightly. If you look up here in your upper limb, where your shoulder and your upper limb meet at that humerus and that scapula, there are several fixator muscles there, muscles there that hold the head of that humerus into that glenoid cavity of that scapula. Good example of fixator muscles there. We can also look at some different muscle types. There are many of them. We'll just mention a few of them right here. Looking at these muscle types, what you're looking at with these different types here are the arrangement of the fasciculi. Now, remember, if you look inside of a muscle, <coughs> the muscle cells are organized into bundles called fasciculi. If you cut into something like a steak, you can often see the orientation of the fasciculi. You can't see the individual cells, but you put a bundle of them together, you can. So next time you cut into a steak, look for the orientation. You see them running one way or another. Well, when you look at these bundles of cells called fasciculi, they can be arranged in different ways. The first one you see up here is a pinnate arrangement. And these are arranged just like the feathers on an arrow. Everyone's seen an arrow in what's called the fletching or the feather part. You've seen how they're in a nice little straight line. There's usually three of them. That's a pinnate arrangement. <clears throat> now, if there's just one arrangement, that's going to be unipinnate. Again, they're all in a nice little row there. 
bipenates where there's two, and multipenate would be three or more or many. Sometimes you see straight arrangements where they're side by side, looked almost like stacked wood when you look at the fasciculi. In the orbicular, a circular arrangement <clears throat> is where you have muscles like around your eye, around your lips, and those circular arrangements are always used for closing and opening. We can also look at some muscle shapes right here. There's a lot of them. These are just some of the more common ones. There's a uh, quadrate up here at the top, which is somewhat of a square-shaped muscle. There's the rhomboidal, a very odd-shaped one, where you have sides with unequal lengths and the angles are not 90 degrees. After that, you got the fusiform, thick in the center and tapered on the ends. Think of something like a football, good example of what you'd expect to see there. Trapezium, a quadrilateral shape with one pair of parallel sides. Sort of like a square that's sort of been taken out of shape to a certain degree. Triangular. <clears throat> Here we got a triangle with these three angles being less than 90 degrees. Digastrics, where you got a muscle with two bellies. So you have an arrangement like where there's a tendon, a belly, a tendon, another belly, and then another tendon. So look what you got, two bellies in between all those tendons right there. And then bicipital, where there's two heads. And remember, heads or origins is the same thing. Think about something like your biceps brachii muscle. It's got two heads, two origins. When you take closer looks at that in pictures, you can see how that's arranged. Looking at nomenclature and how muscles have been named. Since this has been done for a very long time, they've been named in just about any way that you can imagine. So one way that that's been done is by location, like the pectoralis major muscle, pectoral regions, what you think of is your chest region gluteus maximus, that big muscle there is in that gluteal region. What you think of is what you sit on. Brachial region, up here in this upper region of the upper limb from your shoulder to your elbow. Size, maximus for one that's large. Minimus for one that's small. Longus for one that's long. Brevis for a short one. Notice brevis sounds a little like abbreviated. The shape, they might be deltoid, quadratus, teres, round, same thing. We mentioned that in another PowerPoint. The orientation, often muscles run straight from one point to another. So a lot of them have rectus in their name. That means they run straight. Some of them have been named by their origin and insertion. So if you look at where they're attached, look at the bones that that muscle's attached to. Sometimes they take the names of those bones and run them together. And here's a good example of one right here, the sternocleidomastoid. Those muscles are on either side of your neck. They're involved a lot with rotating and flexing the head. But what they did was take sternum, clavicle, and mastoid process and just ran those names together. Sometimes you see the number of heads, biceps and triceps, like you hear up in the upper limb. Function. Look at the action that the muscles are causing, like abduction and adduction. Remember, that's where you move away from the midline of the body or move back towards it. So it tells you a lot about the action of the muscle there. But when you look at how these muscles are working, you got to remember they're working as simple levers. They're pulling on your bones. So they're using these bones as levers to get something moved in the body, whatever that may be. So when you look at the three different types, the classes of levers that we have in the body, there's always three different things you want to look at. You want to look at the bone, which is the actual lever itself. You want to look at the fulcrum, which is the pivot point, and then the weight, whatever it is that you want moved. Now look at some examples of these three. Now what you do, you take these three items, this lever, fulcrum, and weight, and you'll notice that a different one of those three is in between the other two with these three classes of levers. So look at the class one right here. Look at the one that's in the middle, the fulcrum, right? Again, you got three items here. So with a class one lever, the pivot point, the fulcrum, is always in between the force and the weight. Think about a common example of this we've all seen like the seesaw. You look at a seesaw, the pivot point, the fulcrum is right in the middle. That's what makes it a class one lever. And if you look at an example of this in the body, look at the atlanto-occipital joints. This is where your first cervical vertebrae, the atlas, meets the occipital bone on the bottom of your skull. Look at a class two lever here. Now we don't have the pivot point in the middle, we got the weight. So now we got the weight in between the fulcrum and the pull. And a wheelbarrow is a good example of this. Look at what you do with a wheelbarrow. 
you got that wheel. That's the pivot point way out to the end. On the opposite, you got your hands holding those bars, sticks, whatever it may be. And then your weight in the wheelbarrow is right in the center. Again, if the weight's in the middle, you got a class two lever. And then there's the class three. Lastly, only thing has not been in the middle yet is the pull. So now think about a person using a shovel. We think way back to the very end of the shovel, you got your hand acting as the pivot point. At the opposite end, you got the head of the shovel with dirt or whatever it is in it you won't move. And then with your other hand, you've got the pull right in the center. That's your three different classes of levers. Make sure you know which one of those three items is in the middle and also a common example like seesaw, wheelbarrow, or shovel.